So the Transfiguration Sunday, I think, is a tough Sunday to preach. I personally don't like to preach the Transfiguration because it seems too easy, too antiseptic, too flat. We hear the story, Jesus goes up a mountain, he's transfigured, he's visited by Moses and Elijah, three disciples are with him, and then they come down the mountain. And I don't know about you, but in trying to come up with something that I can relate to in this text, I seem to come up empty. And yet this is such an awesome, if not awe-inspiring event. It leaves us transfixed, but sadly, it's not going to last. Just three days from now, we will have really fallen from the mountaintop, from the very depths of our own immortality, receiving ashes on our forehead, being told that we are nothing better than dust in the wind. In just three days. I like to think of the trip from Transfiguration to Ash Wednesday sort of like what it was like to drive with the pastor who confirmed me in Millersburg. Riding in a car with him was like riding in a taxi in Boston. You were scared stiff, you hoped you didn't go the long way, and you hoped you lived through it. That's transfiguration to Ash Wednesday, plummeting to our death, so to speak. And that's our journey until Wednesday, from the mountaintop to the rocks below, from exaltation to rock bottom. Of course, isn't that how Lent should be? There's so many questions about the transfiguration event. Questions like, why were there only three disciples invited to this event? Where were the other nine? Where was Andrew? He's usually included, included in the big four. Here we just have Peter, James, and John. Where, what were they doing? Buying groceries. Who knows? Why does Peter blurt out something silly about building three booths? Except, of course, Peter is the one who usually says something sort of impetuous. Who's not afraid to say what's on his mind, but building booths? And why does Jesus tell the disciples who were with him not to tell anyone? What is this messianic secrecy? Or is Jesus just using reverse psychology? If I tell them not to tell anyone, maybe they'll tell everyone. And I wish I could give you some epiphany, some set of insights into this great event, but alas, I can't. It's one of those events that I think takes years of discernment Still, we may not really appreciate the majesty of the transfiguration, but it, it seems fitting at the end of Epiphany as we now embark on this long and ponderous discernment and discipline of Lent. But I think of those three disciples on that mountain, probably, I think the one, God, the one gospel account says, you know, they were heavy with sleep. And they witness this transformation, and their mouths are just hanging open. They're looking at each other like, did you see that? Was it immediate recognition? Or was it just another event where they leave scratching their heads, not sure what to make? Have you had one of those experiences, something that you witnessed, that it just left you speechless? Sort of scratching your head, like, what did I just see? Fritzy and I, our first apartment was here on Hummel Avenue in the 900 block, right after we got married. And uh, the house was probably built in the 30s or the 40s. Uh, it had those windows with the heavy weight in the, in the side with the rope that sort of the counterweight opening the window. It was, I guess, to keep the window open. But to close it, you had to just about stand on top of it, you know? I was standing at the sink one day doing the dishes, Fritz and I. I'm looking out the window. There's a window right there by the sink. And all of a sudden, the window just closed on its own. This window that you, you had to stand on to get it, it just closed. And I looked at Fritz and I'm like, what was that? That's kind of like the transfiguration. It's unexplained. It's 
It's unexpected. It's almost scary. You know, the two questions, how did it happen and why did it happen? The how question is what theologians, they call it a theophany, a visible manifestation of God to humankind. A visible manifestation of God to humankind. It reminds us of God's transcendency. That God is bigger than all things. All things physical, emotional, cosmically, metaphysically. The why question is difficult, I think. God's obviously saying something about Jesus. And we want to make sense of it without blurting out something silly like Peter. So maybe there's some insight we can, we can discover. And I think part of that insight comes in the Greek word that is translated as transfigured or transformed. Paul uses this word twice in his letters. First to the letter to the church in Rome, second to his first letter to the church in Corinth. To the letter to his to in his letter to the church in Rome, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Be transformed. Not conformed to this world, be transfigured, be transformed in the renewing of your minds. Then he says in first Corinthians, I'm sorry, second Corinthians, his second letter to the church in Corinth, he says, All of us are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Paul's use of this word, I think, helps us to understand, gives us something we can take into the Future, our future experiences. In other words, we are to allow the presence of the Holy Spirit, that same Holy Spirit that was infused in us in our baptisms, the same Holy Spirit is supposed to lead us and guide us to the transforming of our minds. And in turn, is supposed to lead us and guide us in the transforming of our very personhood. Or in other words, it's a continual action, day by day, year by year, ongoing action throughout our lives. Slowly, the Holy Spirit transforms our minds, transforms our hearts, transforms our actions into the image of Christ. For Jesus, it happened in an instant. For us, it takes a lifetime, a journey, of faith. The transfigure, though, does reveal something to us about Jesus. It reveals his sonship, God's voice from the bright cloud that overshadows them. He says, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And besides standing with him, there is Moses and Elijah. So God is bringing together the three Ways that God has spoken to the world. First, he gave us the law. Gave the tablets to Moses. The written law and the oral law. Then God spoke to the people through the prophets. And now God has spoken to the world through his son. So in this one single act, this transfiguration, God presents to us the oneness of God's spoken word, word to all the world. And following the resurrection, the final expression will be the giving of the Holy Spirit to the disciples and to the world. Which means, like Jesus, coming down that mountaintop, telling the disciples not to tell anyone, he goes right back into the midst of humanity. He joins the depths of humanity, the depths of sin and suffering, the miracles, and the joy, and he joins us today in this mixed soup of emotions we call America 2017. That is why this Lenten journey, journey that we are about to embark upon, we need to ask and to pray for the Holy Spirit's presence to lead and guide us. Lead and guide us to serving a hurting world and introducing people to us who do not know this 
Jesus, the beloved Son, the one that we are to listen to. That's part of my challenge, the 50 to Trinity by Trinity, the 50 shakers of salt, the 50 points of light. Because as I see it, there are so many people walking around who have that look on their face like the disciples having just witnessed the transfiguration. Why do people look so scared and confused and shocked? I'll tell you why. So many people can't find work. So many people are worried about their health insurance. So many people are afraid just of others. People who don't look like them. People are afraid of, or, or just fighting the addictions that is just rampant in our society today. And so many people have such a multitude of health problems, the financial burden is just crushing them. And they don't know where to turn. And so we need to invite people to come and see this Jesus of the mountaintop, the transfigured Jesus, the glory of the Lord. And you may laugh at my 50 points of light and my 50 shakers of salt, but I'm telling you that there are a lot of people who feel as if salt is just being rubbed into their wounds of this world. People who feel like their life has been snuffed out. And if you, my friends, if you and I believe that we have been blessed by Jesus, that through the Holy Spirit we have been blessed as salt of the earth and as blessed as light of the world, then we need to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives and to slowly bring about that transformation, that transfiguration into the likeness of Christ. And so we pray that the Holy Spirit does lead us and guide us to people who are at rock bottom. Who need a glimpse of the mountaintop, the jobless, the fearful, the hopeless, the hungry. And with the help of the power of the Holy Spirit, we can show them the mountaintop. The glory of the Lord. Martin Luther King Jr., in one of his final speeches, was called, I've been to the mountain. I want to read a quote. Martin Luther King said, God's allowed me to go up the mountain and I've looked. And I've seen the promised land. And I want you to know that we as a people will get to the promised land. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not worried. I'm not afraid of any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. My friends, we have been to the mountain. We have seen the glory of the Lord, and now it's time for us to take this journey to the cross. Who will you and I invite to join us on this journey? Our friends, God will provide. God will provide people for us to encounter, to invite them here. The Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us. We need to keep our eyes open for those who have not seen the glory of the Lord. Who are hurting, who are hopeless, who are hungry and pray that God uses us to show them the glory of the Lord. So may the Holy Spirit use you and use me to take hurting people by the hand and lead them here. Where Jesus can take them from rock bottom, bottom to the mountain top. Amen? Amen. 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 Why, why don't we stand and sing the hymn of the day, number 815, 815. I want to walk as a child of life. 